Just like most people, I didn't know what a credit score was and even less how to read a credit report. So this is something that most people overlook, but you most likely know that credit is such an important thing that affects so many different aspects in our lives. When it comes to getting approved for a new auto loan, a mortgage, or even how much we spend on the actual interest expense. So here I'm going to show you exactly what the credit score is actually made up of and how you can get your credit score over 800. But before we get to that, I want to show you exactly how to read your credit report because the report itself is going to show you exactly what's actually happening within your credit. And we're going to look at the actual FICO 8 report, which is the one that the banks use. So whenever you actually get your credit report from different sources, you have either the Vantage score or the FICO 8 score. So the Vantage will be the one that you get from your bank online or you're getting it through maybe Nerd Wallet. These are the free versions of your credit report and it's good enough to understand exactly the basics of your credit and what might be happening as far as late payments or maybe your overall marks, but it's really not that in depth. If you're applying for a loan or a credit card or some business funding, this is not the same report the banks are looking at. You'll get a rough estimate of what's happening, but I recommend looking at the FICO 8 credit report. This is the one that's specifically for credit card applications and business funding credit cards. And this is the exact same report that the banks will be looking at. So if you look at this credit report and you have a good understanding of what's happening over here, then you can actually establish some steps on how to move forward so you can fix negative items if they're on there. You can strengthen and add some good accounts on your credit report, which would make you look better to the actual lenders. And you could also just project in the future and try to build a really strong foundation that'll last a lifetime. So I'm gonna show you exactly how you can get that perfect score through actually understanding your credit report. So I have one right here and we're gonna dive into it. So here's a credit report that I've gotten here. So we're gonna walk through the entire process, top to bottom on the actual report itself, what to look for and how you might look at your own report and understand what you should be looking out for. So I got this from My Score IQ. It's one of the websites that I recommend when it comes to getting your FICO 8 report. Again, this is the version of your credit that the banks are looking at. So if you, have, if you want to have the best idea on to next steps when it comes to your credit and how to present yourself in the best way possible, you might as well take the exact same viewpoint that the banks have on your credit. So you can get this through My Score IQ. It's a very low monthly subscription and they'll allow you to refresh your report every single month. This is something that I recommend because again, credit is such an important part of your lives. This will allow you to basically stay on top of your credit and get alerts if something pops up. Because even for me just recently, I had a fraudulent collection report pop up on my report and I wanted to qualify for some more business funding here this next month. And if I didn't have my, my score IQ set up and I wasn't monitoring my credit, I wouldn't have known that I had a collection account that popped up. And if I applied for funding, I would have been automatically denied. So once I had that alert, I then looked on my credit report and I found out exactly what was happening and I was able to dispute that item and get it off, thankfully. So it's really important that you stay on top of your credit. Well, let's get started here. So this is a credit report that we have that dates back to last year. And so this is what exactly it would look like if you got your FICO 8 report from my score IQ, identity IQ is within the same company, so it'll look the same. There are a lot of different companies out there that give you the FICO 8 report. I just happen to recommend this one, but if you get one from another source or a different provider, it'll look very similar. So at the very top of your report, you're gonna have your personal information, so the date of the report, and then below you'll have your actual name, also known as potentially former if you got married and you change your name, for example, your date of birth, your current addresses, previous addresses, and employers, okay? So this is all your personal information. So a quick tip here, this is really important that all your information is actually current and accurate, okay? So there are different ways to update this and we have different trainings on that, but overall, you wanna make sure that this is all accurate and if it isn't, you want to contact the credit bureaus as soon as possible and give them the updated information. Right below, we'll have our actual FICO score. So a good score really starts at 700 plus. 720, I would say, is like great score, really. Over 720, you probably don't have any negative items. 
You probably don't have too many inquiries. Your utilization is probably not that bad either. So 720 is really great. 700, you can start to get approved for things. 720, you're usually gonna get really good business funding results. And the next mark would probably be 760. So above 760, you're probably gonna get the best rates overall. It really doesn't get that much better over 760. And then 800 plus, that's really just for clout, I guess, to be honest with you. There's really not that many benefits to having 800 plus other than saying they have 800 plus credit. So this is a good score overall. And then right below, now we're gonna have the actual details of the report. So this person has 35, 37, 38 total accounts. What you'll notice is that we have the three different credit bureaus, okay? There's three different agencies that collect your data online and they get these different sources from the banks, the lenders, online companies such as Affirm, okay? So a lot of different people that lend to you basically and they gather all this information. And so a lot of the information will be the same across all three different bureaus. However, sometimes they're different, okay? So right here we can see that one of the open accounts is not reporting to Experian, for example. And there's different inquiries because each bank tends to pull one specific credit bureau. And this is just based on their preference and potentially where you're actually located within the country. So really important that you look at all three credit bureaus because if you're applying for a new loan, the lender might pull all three credit bureaus, they might pull one, and it's just best to have all three of them optimized. So with this report, thankfully we can get an entire viewpoint of everything. So overall, 18 plus accounts, I'd say this is a really good metric. If you wanna have a perfect credit report or perfect credit score, you need to have at least eight accounts open. So he's got even more than that, so he's in a good spot. Honestly, having a lot of different credit accounts isn't a bad thing. You obviously need to be able to manage it correctly and not make any mistakes, but having more will actually strengthen your credit because you're having more on-time payments every single month. So this looks good. He does have a lot of closed accounts, so you could potentially clean this up just by updating it with the credit bureau, just asking them to remove outdated information. But if you have like a lot of paid off loans, sometimes that could actually make you look a little bit better when you apply for a new loan because you've already paid it off before, right? So you're a good borrower. So keeping these on isn't a bad thing. It just makes the report look a little busy sometimes. So up to you if you want to take it off or not. And then right below the closed accounts, now we can see the bad part, okay? So right here we have delinquent and derogatory. So delinquent are accounts that are currently in bad standing and then derogatory is just negative basically. So we'll, we'll look exactly what the accounts are. We'll try to go find them on the report. Collections, so whenever you have a, a debt, first it'll be current and active. You're making payments every single month. Then it'll go into late payment if you miss a payment. So you might have a mark as a, a late payment. So this could be usually both, okay? So derogatory or just negative in general. Delinquent is usually going to be something that then becomes a collection. So with the account, you'll be current. Then you have a late payment. So now that's, that's a derogatory mark. And it's gonna be a late payment. If you then keep it basically inactive or you're still missing a lot of different payments overall, the account will then actually get charged off. So now the account is going to be a charge off account. And then that basically means that the lender is giving up on you. So you've been late for usually three or four months, usually four months plus is when they actually give up on collecting the debt and then they charge it off, which means that they basically write it off as a loss and they sell your debt to a collection agency. So that's why typically whenever you have an account go that delinquent, you actually have two negatives now, unfortunately, because you have the original account that's now negative, and then you have the collection account, which is going to be a whole different negative account. So the original debt is sold off to a collection agency, usually for a huge discount for the credit card company, for example. And then the collection agency tries to make a profit by basically collecting the debt above the cost of what they bought it from the credit card company. So let's say, for example, you owe the credit card company 10,000, you missed the payments for four months, the credit card company might sell that debt to a collection agency for $1,000, and then the collection agency is gonna come after you for 10K. So a lot of people don't end up paying that collection account. So a lot of people 
don't actually allow them to get their money back. But then if they only get their money back out of one out of 10 people, they're breaking even basically. But if then they have more people paying them off, now they can profit $9,000 because they bought the debt for, for one and then they're getting the money back for 10. So that's basically how the actual collection agencies work. And if you have a collection on your report, unfortunately, that's not going to fix your relationship with the original bank if you do pay it off because they already gave up on it. They already sold off the debt. If you pay off the collection, you're just trying to fix it with that collection agency. And to be honest with you, if you do that, it's usually still not going to come off your credit report. If you're going to try to fix a collection account, you need to either have a pay to delete, which means that you have some kind of agreement with that collection agency saying that you will remove the account if I pay you and, or, or rather, or you could potentially dispute the, the actual collection. If you get the collection entirely removed, most of the time it doesn't pop back on. They could sometimes still pursue you and the account might come back on your credit report, but you can actually dispute the collection and get it off entirely. So up to you. If you were to pay it, you can actually negotiate usually as well and get about 50% off because in that example I gave you, they're buying it for a thousand. They're trying to collect 10,000. So you could potentially negotiate your way down to five and they still make their 4,000 and you're saving all that money. So one way to do that. But basically, this is where we're going to find those negative items. We want this to be zero right here. We want to have a dash on delinquent, derogatory and collections. Balances and payments. So balances is what's going to and payments will involve your, your DTI ratio. So if you're going for a loan, they're going to want to see exactly how much debt are you paying every single month. Public records. So this will be if you have bankruptcies or anything like that on your report. Then inquiries. So we'll talk about inquiries in a second here, but this is usually pretty good. You want to be below three, basically. So do you actually get to the accounts now? So this is the name of the actual lender at the very top. You will then have each credit bureau. And then you have it all sectioned off here. So we have the account number. This will allow you to basically find the account associated with it. Most of the time, it's not your actual credit card number that's on there. It's the actual account that they have on your bank. So if you were to contact the bank, you could give them the account number and they'll be able to find you. But you have the account number right here. You also have the account type. So usually the credit report has a certain order. So I'll go through the order here, but you have the account type. So in this case, it's an actual loan. We have installment accounts, we have revolving accounts, we have collection accounts. Those are usually the three different types right there. So account, installment account. So that means it's a loan. Again, so now we can see it's an auto loan, a little bit more detail. Bureau code, so this is a joint account. So it could be either your own account, it could be a joint account, meaning you co-signed with someone. So if it's a husband and wife, for example, or if it's a father and son, this would be like a joint account. Could also be an authorized user account, meaning that someone added you to their own credit card. Those are great for different reasons, but the bureau code is basically what type of ownership do you have over this account? Account status, so this one's actually closed currently. Monthly payments is how much you spend usually every single month. On a credit card, it might be like your minimum payments. On a loan, it's usually how much you pay every single month. Date open, so this is when you first opened up the accounts. Current balance, so how much debt do you currently have outstanding? Number of months terms, so that's usually the length of the loan. High credit, so this is usually for a loan, the max amount you had at the very beginning because that's the highest point when you first started paying it off. On a credit card, it's the highest balance you ever carried on the credit card. It doesn't really matter so much for credit cards, but it's more like a historical data. Credit limit, so for a loan, it doesn't really, uh, doesn't really, I guess, have any sense to it, right? We'll talk, we'll see those on our credit card account. Past due. Usually I don't really see the comments inside the past due. We'll see them a little bit below. So whenever you have negative accounts, this is where you're going to find out exactly which account it is. So again, we saw that he has two negatives. So for the two negatives, we'll see within payment status or comments. So payment status, I don't see anything under TransUnion. I don't see anything under Equifax, but on Experian, there is a comment that says past due 30 days, two or three times. So this is an example of why we need to look at all three credit bureaus because if I was just looking at TransUnion, I wouldn't understand why, like why this one is derogatory. I wouldn't even maybe know, but I do know that this is negative, however, because it is still showing up as negative 
even though the comments not popping up. Another way to look at it is again in the comments. In another way is to actually look at the actual payment history. However, the payment history at the bottom is only going to show you usually the latest two years. So the latest two years here dated back to 2017 and we can actually see 30 days, 30 days, 30 days. So we can actually see that history back here, but it says it happened two or three times. So in this example, for example, we wouldn't be able to see it past that. So it's actually been negative multiple different times. So that's why it's important to look in all three areas. So the payment status, comments, and also that two year payment history. So this would be one account, for example, I would want to focus on to get removed because having any negative accounts on your credit report are going to really hurt you when it comes to applying for business funding, if that's your goal, or just having low rates whenever you apply for new debt products. So really important that we always clean our credit report whenever we can, whenever anything pops up as soon as possible. When I had that collection account pop up on my credit report, I started disputing it that very next day. And then within a month it came out because we have great strategies for, for cleaning that stuff up. But that's the goal here basically. So whenever I look at my report, I try to figure out exactly what's hurting me. And then I go and identify what exactly that is. And then we can basically take steps to now dispute it. So in this case, I know that I have a negative account with American Honda Finance. So I would want to grab my account number and start to make take those steps to actually dispute the account. But that's how we read that last reported. So most likely this is when he paid it off. So he paid it off in 2017. So there's no more history to show. So whenever you have like an active account, or like a credit card, it's most likely going to show you the previous month or current month. So last reported in this case, he paid it off in 2017. So there's no new history to show. That's what that is. Comments is are kind of random. Sometimes it shows a negative. It could be something else. Last date active. So somewhat similar to that one. Date of last payment. I usually don't see too much in there, but yeah. And then we can see the last two years of payment history. So we can see exactly when the negatives happened. Again, there's sometimes a little bit different, but it's important to look at all three bureaus. So when it comes to the order of the credit report, usually the negatives at the very top. So that's why even though I didn't see this was negative, it probably was. And the fact that we can see it on the other credit bureau makes it that much more obvious. But at the very top, usually you'll have the negative accounts on your credit report. So the next one would be TD Bank. And I can see right away it's a negative because, again, I look at payment status. It was past due 30 days, right? So it makes it very easy for me to see. And in, if it was two months past, I wouldn't even see the 30 days late right here. So that's why it's really important to look at all three different areas, the payment status, comments, and the two-year payment history. So in this case, we have a credit card account that was closed. It was opened in 2014. So this is when the different line items are a little bit different when it comes to revolving. So a revolving account is a credit card. So there's just two different ways to call it. The bureau code in this case is an inv individual account. So he actually owns this credit card, it's his. Account status is closed, monthly payment he doesn't have anymore. Date opened, current balance is zero, revolving, high credit. So at any point, this was the highest balance that he ever had on this credit card. The credit limit was 4,800. So how is that possible? They probably lowered his credit limit as soon as he started paying it off. So the credit limit on your credit card is basically how much spending power you have. So if you have a credit card limit, that's $10,000, you're allowed to spend up to $10,000 on that credit card before they stop your transactions. And the goal here is that you want to keep the balances as low as possible. So you can spend it however much you want on your credit card, but you need to pay it off as much as possible by the end of the month. So whenever you're using credit cards, ideally you use them like a debit card and you only use money you actually have. So although you can spend $10,000, if you don't have $10,000 in the bank to then pay it off, I really wouldn't spend that much because then you start to fall into like a debt spiral. So this is your credit limit. It is good to have large limits, however, and having that spending ability, because for one, if you do carry a balance, the percentage ratio will be smaller. So if you have a $500 balance on the credit card and your credit limit is 1000, that's a 50% utilization, which is really high. But if you have that same 500 balance on a $10,000 limit credit card, well, that same balance is only 5%, which is a good number. So that's why having larger limits helps on that fashion. 
The banks also like to see comparable debt. So if you've managed high limits before, they'll feel comfortable providing you high limits in the future, especially when it comes to business funding. So if you're submitting applications for new business credit cards, if you've, ha if you've handled large limits on the personal side, it'll make it a lot easier for you to get approved for large limits on the business side as well. So great to look into that. But overall, you can build up your credit limits by requesting credit line increases every six months, getting premium credit cards and, and all that. But here's your credit limits, payment status. So again, we can see right here that he was past due 30 days, two or three times. We can see at least one of them right here, last reported. So this is probably when the account was closed. So we can see in the comments here that the grantor was the one that actually canceled the credit card. So the TD Bank actually closed the account on him. You are a grantee if you borrow, grantor is a person lending out. So they actually closed the account on him. He probably paid it off. He wasn't using it and then they closed it on him. So if you have a late payment on there, they probably won't close it off. But if you pay it off, they, they might just because you had negative history. But this would be an account that I would definitely target to remove. And the fact that the accounts are closed and pays off, paid off does make it a lot easier to get the accounts removed as well. It's a lot more straightforward. If they're not entirely paid off, you can still do it. They might still just pop back up though because you obviously still do owe some money. It depends. Sometimes they kind of give up on you. Sometimes they don't, they come back. If you remove it two, three times, usually they'll, they'll give up after a while. So that's how it usually works. But in this case, number one focus would be removing those two derogatory accounts. Where are they? We go find them. We see in the comments, 30 days, 30 days. So these are the two accounts to focus on. And then after the negative accounts, usually you go into loan accounts. So in this case, for example, we have Digital Fed Credit Uni. So this again is an installment account. So that means a loan. Detail is auto loan. It's his own account, currently open. His monthly auto loan payment is $787. It was opened in 2023. The current balance is 49,790. It's a 84 month loan. And the high credit is, I guess, basically, we probably just opened this up when we got this, when we got this report. So it was a brand new loan, basically, because his current balance is also the highest balance it ever was. So if you made one payment, it'd go down to about 49,000. The balance would say 49,000, high limit 49,790. So that's how that works. Payment status in this case, though, is paying as agreed, current paying as agreed, there's no comments, there's no negative. So in this case, I have no reason to believe that there's any negative history. And I know that there isn't anything negative because we can already find these. Sometimes it is kind of tricky. You have to go and kind of dig in the report to figure out exactly what are these negatives. But most of the time it is pretty straightforward. So we just have to do a little bit of digging and but we figured it out. So we'll go through these a little bit quicker, but Department of Education, this is an education loan. So a student loan, again, all the loans will be towards the top. We can see the balance, the high credit. So there was a, a period, a, a grace period right now with the education loans that didn't make anyone make any payments. So this is probably what happened here. You didn't have to make any payments. You probably will have to soon because I think they're, they're stopping that, however. So currently has that balance currently maxed out for the auto loan the, or a education loan. This is another student loan. So this one he has been making payments on. You can see that the high limit was basically the highest amount. Now he's a little bit lower, but he has good payment history, right? And then we continue some more education loans. Now we have another auto loan as well with PNC Bank. So the monthly payments here are 568. He opened the loan for 34,207, but he has been making payments on it. And now the balance is down to 30,311. So that's good. Current history is good. Education loan, account status. This might have been transferred probably. So yeah, account transferred to another office. So he probably had the loan with the US Department of Education and then it became one of these loans. So if we wanted to basically figure this out, we would see 12,950 back in 2016. 12,000. So then they, they probably broke it into these three diff different loans now. So you had one loan and then they broke it into three different ones for whatever reason. Okay. So that was transferred. It's a closed account. There's an auto loan that's paid off. So typically, as I mentioned, 
they like to see comparable debt. So if you're getting auto loans, you have to basically kind of climb the ladder if you want to get really nice cars. So if you were to buy a car that's over $100,000, even if you make a million a year, you've never handled a 100K loan before for auto loan, and the banks will probably not extend it to you. Typically, you have to climb that ladder for auto loan. So typically, you start around 30 to maybe up to 50,000. And then every single time, you'll get about 50% higher approvals. So if you start at 50, you might get 75 next. Then you'll go around 100. Then you go to 150. And then you can basically go all the way up to 250 usually. So that's how that works. But it's good to have these on there just to kind of show past good, good history. Then we have more auto loans. So now after the loans, we get into credit cards. So those are the revolving accounts that I mentioned. So these are revolving accounts, also called credit cards. So again, we can see the account number right below. We have the account details. This is also an individual account. So he owns the account. Account status is currently open. Monthly payments is usually the minimum payment to keep the account in good standing. So $40 open in 2014. The older the accounts you have on your credit report, the better, because they like to see a lot of on-time payments. This makes your credit report look really good. So the fact that he has that is great. He has a very low balance as well compared to his credit limit, right? It's about 1% of his credit limit. So he's doing a great job with this. High credit limit. So at one point it was maxed out, but now it's not. Okay, so you can kind of get like a picture, like a history almost with uh, this credit report, which is interesting. But we can see right here that the credit limit or the credit balance was high, but not anymore. Credit limit's currently 5,100. Current, current. So it's all good. Apple Card, so this is also an open account. Monthly payment 25. Balance here is at almost at 50%. Usually with credit cards, you wanna have your balances below 30. 30% 30 is really a great metric to have to maximize and get it below 10%, that's even better. But below 30 is, is still a pretty good number. So in this case, he's almost at 50, so you probably want to pay this one down a little bit. Right here, he's in a good spot. Individual, open, current. So here's an authorized user account. So I do like these for a couple of different reasons, but authorized users basically allow you to get added to someone's history. So if you right now are really young, you don't have that much credit history to show, you could actually piggyback off of someone else's history by getting added to a credit card. There's a huge benefit here in which you can benefit from their entire history. So if they have a credit card that they opened a long time, that's going to increase your average age. So if you have one credit card that's one month old, so basically zero years, and then this person adds you to a credit card that's been open for 10 years, well now your average goes from zero all the way up to five, right? 10 plus zero divided by two, so five, that's your new average. So authorized users are great for that. And it's also great because it could potentially add you to an account that has a high limit. Again, you want to see comparable debt. The banks want to see comparable debt. So if you don't have high limits right now yourself, you can get added to high limit credit cards. And then when you go and apply for other premium credit cards or business funding, the fact that you can manage a high limit credit card means that you might get approved for some. So the whole benefit here is getting added to the accounts to benefit from the history but you don't even actually have to have the credit card itself in your possession. You don't have to actually even use a credit card, but you can still benefit from this. So if someone adds you, it has no cost, it does not affect their credit at all, and you get all the history, which is, which is great. You don't even have to actually use a credit card. So I think it's a great way to really boost up your credit if you're at the very beginning, or if you're maybe lacking some factors, or if you just wanna strengthen it just to do it. So really good for that. It's a good thing that he added this account because so far I don't think I've seen anything over 10K, which is usually the metric I recommend for my business funding clients to have at least one account that's over 10K because that'll make it a lot easier for us to get these 50K approvals on the business credit cards. Because if your highest limit's 5,000, 5,000 to 50, that's 10 times more. But if you have a 10,000 limit, it's only five times more now. So a lot better. Then we have Capital One, so this is his own account. Balance is almost maxed out, so we'd probably recommend paying this down. Discover is currently open, balance is zero, so that's great. Authorized user with Chase. Chase is a great bank, so this is interesting. On the credit reports, it's whatever the internal information is. It basically is. So Chase is JP Morgan Chase Bank, so you just have to kind of understand a little bit behind the scenes on what's going on. But this is Chase card. 
authorized user account. I think building a relationship with Chase is great because they're one of the best banks for funding in general. So really good to use that and build a relationship with them. Somewhat of an older account as well. At the time of this report, it's about four years. So pretty good. However, with the authorized user account, you also are getting the entire history. So if they miss any payments or if they actually carry a high balance, that account's going to start to hurt you actually. So you need to make sure that the person actually using the credit card is using it responsibly. So they're at 10%, which is fine. They don't want to bring that up too much higher though. Open accounts is a charge card. So sometimes charge cards don't actually have a credit limit. It's a whole different training right there, but they just kind of operate differently. It's usually based off the of spend. If you spend a lot and you pay it off, they'll just grow it very quickly. But if you don't spend on the credit card, they'll bring it down very quickly as well. So it basically changes month to month. SYNCB so is usually a store card. So it's a company that white labels store credit cards. So the stores don't actually have to run a whole credit card department. They just outsource it to SYNCB. So this is probably a, a store credit card. Again, balance is low, credit limit solid. Here's an Amazon store card, 700, zero. And something I'll say as well is that if you do have a credit card that's at zero balance, you don't use a credit card and it's been a while, they could eventually close the credit card. And it's not gonna work in your favor just because having old accounts with a lot of on-time payments, a very long history is going to increase your, your average age and the banks just like to see that. So if you have accounts that you're not really using right now, I'd still really try to keep them open just by having some kind of activity. So you could do that just by signing up with a subscription service like Netflix, for example, and then setting up the auto pay. So that basically it keeps strengthening the account, still keeps it active. You don't have to think about it. So there's a bunch of store cards here. And so next we go into the closed accounts. So typically it goes with negatives, then installment accounts, closed installment accounts, then credit card revolving, and then closed credit card slash revolving. So that's usually the order of the reports. So here we saw the open, now we're going to closed. So here's a closed credit card right here, it's been paid off. Again, it's probably best to keep these open because he had a relationship with Bank of America. I don't think I saw another account with Bank of America, so now he basically kind of lost that. He still had a paid off account, but it would have been better if he actually kept that open. It seems that he actually requested to close it, which if you have a premium credit card, just ask to downgrade it to a free one or try to consider getting a retention offer with them. So you can basically call them and try to ask them if they have any offers to keep you on board because they want to keep you on board because they charge their, their little fees. And sometimes they'll incentivize you to stay on board by canceling your annual fee, for example. And then we just have more closed accounts. So again, you could potentially get these off if you wanted to, but it's not really hurting you at all. And then as we make our way down the report here at the very bottom, we have the inquiries. So inquiries are basically marks that happen whenever you go and apply for debt. So this signals to other lenders that you're actually looking for debt. So it doesn't really hurt you that much on a score basis, but if you start to have too many, you basically look more desperate and the banks hate desperate borrowers basically so they want to lend to people that don't really need the lending funny enough because they feel more comfortable with the fact that you'll probably be able to pay it off so you need to keep your inquiries as low as possible if you have more than three inquiries on a bureau and a bank pulls that credit bureau they'll probably actually deny you automatically so that's why you want to keep your inquiries as low as possible we have different trainings on inquiries as well, but basically you can remove inquiries if they're not attached to open personal accounts. So there's a whole different dispute process there. If you do want to learn more about inquiries, just comment down below. We do have some great trainings on how to actually go through that process. Just drop the comment inquiry removal and I'll send you a free training on how to actually get these inquiries off. But basically you can remove any inquiry that's not attached to an open personal account. And that also means that you can dispute any business funding application, whether you get approved or denied, because business funding would not show up on this report. If you got a Chase credit card for 50K on your business and you max it out, this would never show up on this credit report because it's attached to your EIN number, not your social security number. So these are great to actually use and grow your business because it's not going to affect your credit report at all. And because it's not showing up on your report, you can remove those inquiries. So let me know if you want that, that training right there. 
But here are the different inquiries. You'd figure out exactly when the inquiry happened, what was the credit bureau, and who was the lender, okay? So to figure out if you can dispute it, basically try to match the, the lender, the name down here, and the actual opening of the account. So there's a whole different strategy right there, but that's basically the general gist. But here's where you find your inquiries. The inquiries matter the most for the last six months. They still matter for 12 months. Over 12 months, they won't affect you at all. And then they drop off after two years. So for this one, for example, this is most likely dropped off already because right now I'm in March of 24. I did get this report. I think it dates back to maybe September of 23. So it's still beyond here, but after two years, it drops off. But anything over 12 months won't affect you at all. So you don't have to even worry about them. So let's say that we were, again, March of 24. All of these right here would not affect this borrower, this individual at all. So you don't have to worry about these. I would basically just count two Equifax inquiries on his entire profile. Whenever you were to apply for funding, for example, whenever you're applying for funding or applying for new debt, you basically play Tetris and you want to apply for banks that aren't going to pull the credit bureaus that have too many inquiries. So in this case, if he was building out a sequence, I would do three Experian banks, one Equifax bank and three TransUnion banks. So that's how you do that. Public info so is usually the bankruptcies, okay? Public filings, if you have some kind of um, child support, it might pop up in here. And then down below, we have creditor contacts. So if you were to dispute an item, for example, you need to send a letter, this is where you'd find the creditor information. So you have the name of the lender, the address, and you even have their phone number. So you can find all this information at the bottom. That's basically it. That's how you read your credit reports. So I gave in some little tips basically throughout the video on how to actually optimize by looking at the different items on your credit report and how to actually approach the process to getting it all cleaned up. So if you have questions about the entire dispute process, for example, just comment down below dispute removal and I'll try to send you a training. But otherwise, I hope this training basically kind of gave you more clarity on the entire credit report process, what actually goes into your credit score and how the entire system works. And if you do have any more questions, just comment down below and I'll get to them as soon as I can. But overall, if you do want to learn more about credit, building up your credit and even getting funding to grow your business, make sure to subscribe to this channel and I'll give you a lot more value as to how to actually navigate this entire process. But thanks for watching this video and I'll see you soon.